Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second of the two-part ISAS lecture series deemed One Year into the Sri Lanka Podujana Piramuna Parliamentary Victory. Today's lecture topic is titled Sri Lanka's Foreign Policy and International Relations. We would first like to acknowledge the presence of His Excellency, Mr. S. Chandra Das, Singapore's non-resident High Commissioner of Sri Lanka. We thank him for being here with us today. Before we proceed with the event, I would appreciate it if all participants could mute their microphones when other speakers are in conversation. Do drop your questions into the chat box at any point during the session, as that will help us facilitate the Q&A segment. Today, we are delighted to have with us our guest speaker, Dr. Manisha S. Bonasinghe Pascal, Senior Lecturer, Department of International Relations, University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. And chairing the discussion will be Dr. Chulani Atanayak, Research Fellow, Institute of South Asian Studies, National University of Singapore. I now invite Dr. Chulani to deliver the opening remarks. Dr. Chulani, please. Thank you, Shavinya. Ambassador Chandra Das, Dr. Mani Shavani Singh Pasquale, and fellow participants, let me welcome you once again for this second lecture where we will be discussing Sri Lanka's foreign relations um, under President uh, my, um, Gotabe Rajpaksha's administration. So uh, when President Gotabe Rajpaksha came into power, there was promise for change at so many levels. On the foreign policy front, there was promise to follow a non-aligned foreign policy or a neutral foreign policy. It has been almost two years into his presidential election victory and one year into the parliamentary election victory. We saw that at initial stage, uh, efforts are being made to follow this path. There was emphasis on reviving economy through foreign economic relations and um, developing relationship with Asian countries, etc. Despite these commitments, key development in foreign policy decisions present mixed results. The Rajapaksha government's decision to withdraw from the co-sponsored United Nations uh, Human Rights Commission resolution um, complicated its ties with the US and the West. After a cordial start uh, with India, unresolved bilateral issues, uh, which have snowballed over the years, and the breaking off of the East Container Terminal Agreement put, re put relations into a back burner. On the other hand, Sri Lankan government maintains a strong economic relationship with Beijing. Additionally, there are opportunities for Sri Lanka to play an active role in regionalism and multilateralism through institutions such as SARC and BIMSTEC. So to talk about these developments and issues, we are happy to have Dr. Manisha uh, with us today. Dr. Manisha is an alumnus of the Uni University of Colombo, University of Notre Dame, and George Mason University, United States. Her research focus is on conflict analysis and human security. We are delighted to have you, Dr. Manisha, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to be invited. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I will um, kind of give you a broad sense of which, how I'm going to approach this presentation and then go on to uh, introduce certain facts and certain sets of data. Uh, for example, I, um, I, I follow this notion that it's, it's, it's a conceptual idea introduced by Brescia, Steinberg and Stein a long time ago, about 50 years ago. But the idea is that the entire environment of the foreign policy making uh, impacts uh, the decisions that are made. So, for example, the operational environment, which is from the global to the sub, uh, sub uh, sectoral to bilateral to uh, domestic um, are all impact. So the external as well as the internal, including uh, economic capabilities, what are the interest groups. So operational environment impacts the communication as well as the decision making of the elite. What is the baggage they bring at the moment of uh, making these decisions? All this is impacting the key decisions and key project trajectory of uh, foreign policy making. 
So if you take Prashar's ideas and you know, bring it forth to our situation in Sri Lanka, we have to say that when um, Gotabe Rajapaksa government came to power, he came with, of course, he himself was uh, did not come with the baggage that his brother Mahinda Rajapaksa did, and that is the entire baggage of the war situation and after that from 2009 to 2015 all the decisions made with regard to China, with regard to Middle East, with regard to USA, with regard to all the decisions, everything, the baggage came with the Mahinda Rajapaksa becoming the Prime Minister of the country of, of Sri Lanka. Now what is interesting is that Gotabe Rajapaksa um, in his um, inauguration uh, in, in the manifesto introduced by the Pudujana uh, Peramuna, which is Sri Lanka People's Front, um, I'm quoting, um, say, stated that it is going to be, as you said, friendly, non-aligned uh, foreign policy. Now, this has been the statement of Sri Lankan foreign policy, uh, I mean, since 1950s. We have, Sri, as a country, we have been friendly to all since 1948. Uh, and, and especially since 1956 onwards, we have always been friendly and this uh, those terminology of non-aligned. But in his, um, in, his, um, in his manifesto, he actually quoted and said, the basis of a foreign, will, foreign policy will be to ensure that Sri Lanka's territorial integrity and independence are respected and protected in the interest of the citizens and future generations of this country. It, is, it also aims to ensure that Sri Lanka's dignity as a sovereign nation is respected. No harmful agreements, treaties will um, be entered into by our government. Uh, foreign policy will be based on non-alignment, as I said, and mutual friendship and trust among nations. We will not fail in our uh, fall to our knees before any country in maintaining foreign policy and trade relations. We will always be mindful of our national sovereignty and maintain friendly relations. Again, a reiterator, reiteration of the friendly relations uh, from a standpoint, standpoint of equality. Our government will restore Sri Lanka's national pride and dignity. There are, of course, underlying political thematic conceptualizations here, but President Rajapaksa uh, reiterated this at the United Nations in uh, September 20, uh, uh, 22nd. In his first uh, speech in December 9, uh, 2019, he spoke about these ideas. And if you um, kind of summarize what he has uh, focused upon, you'll see that he looks at, um, it's a neutral foreign policy. Now that has, we, are, we can talk about whether this is really neutral or whether we are trying to escape from making certain statements, uh, but uh, no affiliation is what the highlight is. Um, because of his strategic placement, that is also going to be a concern. Um, and so if you take the statements, there are four kind of core ideas that you get. The implementation of the stated outcomes of the manifesto despite domestic challenges. Now, these are the things, if you look at the year or plus more than one year of implementing of the foreign policy, how to ensure this manifesto and the conceptualization of what he wanted in that speech into the reality. Uh, to balance Sri Lanka's relations with immediate neighbors, regional powers, um, I'm putting India into both those categories, um, and major powers. This is especially important with regards to relations with India, China, USA, Japan. Um, the, the quad itself uh, is there, as, uh, but the, the immediate neighbors, the distant neighbors and major powers. To overcome global economic um, downturn and the country specific debt crisis that we are having. And finally, to overcome international pressure based on Sri Lanka with regard to the human rights record. Now, um, this, this, um, this, I think people have written and talked a great deal about the Sri Lankan um, issue with regard to human rights. I won't talk too deeply on that, um, but 
in our question and answer, we can talk about it. So in the stated manifesto, he has said, we will ensure ownership of strategic assets. So I'm going to really talk more on how Sri Lanka is attempting to um, remain independent, uh, remain neutral, remain friends for all kind of attitude that we have in the midst of this overcoming the strategic, uh, the, the ownership of strategic assets and economically important natural resources. Now, in his manifesto, he has specifically stated that he will not transfer any to any foreign countries. But at the moment of his coming to power, we already had, Sri Lanka already had huge issues. We have five loans taken during the Mahindra Rajapaksa era, 2007 to 2014 period specifically. Uh, well, some of these um, loans are at a high in uh, interest rate of about 6%. So it's a very high interest rate. And, and so these loans are already in place and Sri Lanka has to pay 100 million uh, payments, uh, repayment every year. And then we have also in 2017, Sri Lanka uh, came into uh, came to sign the 99 lease in the uh, of its uh, Hambantara port. Um, Hambantara port, the 99 year lease was a hugely debated issue. So again, the the domestic, how the domestic impacts the international and how these impact the the government of Rajapaksa is very interesting to note because 2017 it wasn't the uh, Rajapaksa government. It was, so um, 2015, Mahindra Rajapaksa government ended. 2015 to 2019, the uh, Maitri Pala Senanayaka, Maitri Pala, sorry, Maitri Pala, and um, Vikramasinghe government was in place. And at that time, what you have is the, the sudden, not, uh, uh, it, was, it was very sudden for Sri Lankans the 99 year lease of Sri Lanka port to the Chinese merchant port holding company and CM port as it's called. And uh, CM port is actually um, a, a Chinese government owned entity. So it was a lease between the CM port and the Sri Lanka ports authority with um, which from the moment it came up, um, the people, the government, the opposition, everyone, considered it an unfair uh, deal. Now, um, because CN Port has 70 to 80% stake in the development, while the Sri Lankan government through the Sri Lanka Ports Authority has about 20 to 30% ownership of it. Um, so when the Rajapaksa government, Gotabe Rajapaksa government comes to power again, they are faced with this major problem because the government received $1.12 billion for the lease. There were lots of um, uh, concerns that this was a swap, that in return for um, this money, we are swapping and giving a lease. From the you know, analysis of data, of course, it's obvious that it is not, but at the same time, the perception of the people when Gotabe Rajapaksa comes to power, is that this lease has to end. There has to, it, this cannot go forward. So after one year, what you have is multiple uh, layers coming up. So for example, the courts, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, the courts ruled that, um, um, courts ruled that, um, the 99 year lease, uh, parts of the 99 year lease um, was unconstitutional. That components of it uh, required, now this is very interesting, a referendum. You cannot change the structure of the, uh, the, the country, you know, there are lots of aspects of that. So what you have is the government coming and uh, striving to create and alter the, the, this particular um, agreement 
without negating it and without going towards a referendum. Now, that is a very kind of complex situation, right? Uh, because by May, uh, a bill is created. Uh, um, so it, uh, in the bill, um, Colombo Port City Economic Commission was created to, to appease the Sri Lankan side of the, this equation. Uh, the, five, uh, um, out of the seven members, five would be from Sri Lanka. And the, um, the, car, the commission itself had the decisions and the power to decide on um, the rules. The, on on what, who has exemptions for uh, taxations and all these little uh, aspects of that so that you can't negate it because the deal has already been made. And um, along with that, you have um, the fact that you need the money to develop the port. Because by the time in one year time from the moment of the, from actually from 2014 when it was uh, it was in a negative. I mean, it was not doing any uh, any positive trade uh, as at all according to uh, some uh, documents. Hambatarapika has become a major stop for ships, uh, especially in the case of the COVID situation. So the the concern of um, the, the government was not just about foreign policy, but also how it impacts the domestic. Um, so um, then you have, you so uh, COVID situation itself. So let's, let's swing on to the kind of the COVID part as well. I'm going to kind of amalgamate everything here. Uh, from a negative growth, as I said, we now have a situation where 36,000 ships uh, 4,500 oil tankers come, geographical positioning has made this, uh, this port quite worthwhile and its development uh, very important. So the government cannot negate the, the agreement. Uh, so, and also the government needs 1.12 billion on it. But also note that the 1.12 billion was not really uh, spent to um to uh pay back those loans they paid back short-term loans and others but it is actually um to um kind of um uh, kind of enhance sri lanka's foreign reserves uh that was what the government used it for and what you have then is other than that i mean the the chinese presence in sri lanka has increased from 2007, 2008, 2009, especially after uh, the end of the war, to an extraordinary amount of uh, uh, kind of soft power and huge presence. Now, there's one very interesting thing about why Mahindra Rajapaksa went towards uh, China, just a small kind of side note, is that at the moment of um, winning the war, uh, we didn't have any funding, any uh, any assistance to develop the country. Uh, there were teasers uh, put out towards India, towards the West, towards other countries, but only China was interested in the development of the port and other um, other uh, kind of how do we develop the country that part. But with under Gotabe Rajapaksa, who had himself had very close ties with China prior to coming becoming the president, um, you have India and other Quad countries being very concerned about this Chinese presence. With China, China having a foothold in Sri Lanka, near, very much near the one of the busiest, uh, the busiest maritime route in the world. We are 10 nautical miles, 10, 6 to 10 nautical miles from the busiest uh, route, uh, maritime route in the world. So to have China's presence in having such a strong hold in Hamburg uh, meant that we had other opportunities uh, by other countries to introduce, um, you know, 
other opportunities for developing the port. So for example, the Colombo port, the East Terminal, as as the um, as presenter introduced me and as she was talking about it, Julani, uh, the fact that um, the East Container Terminal project between India, Japan, and Sri Lanka was introduced while Sri Lanka got about 500 to 700 million investment. But again, the very concern of the 99 lease, 99 euro lease, that history impacted the domestic opposition to the terminal being uh, uh, you know, enhanced. Of course, Sri Lankan government uh, really did um, uh, take back that uh, East Container Terminal and went for the uh, went with the Adani Group, which is an Indian group, uh, to develop the West Terminal. But there is a cautious uh, step back by both India and um, Japan on how to invest in Sri Lanka, how to uh, take uh, control or, uh, of the influence that they had. Now we can also see that another aspect which is, comes in immediately with this is um, at, uh, the words he, uh, in the manifesto of uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa where he says, we will adopt a non-aligned policy in all our foreign dealings and work with all friendly nations on equal terms. Uh, this is, has been, as I said, a cornerstone of Sri Lankan foreign policy since the 1950s. But the first country, in, indeed, the first country to congratulate uh, Prime Minister Rajapaksa and President Rajapaksa was India, uh, with uh, uh, President Modi, uh, Prime Minister Modi saying that India uh, congratulates Sri Lanka and Mahindra Rajapaksa in turn saying India is our friend and relation. Um, but you can see that because of uh, the influence of China, and especially since China's embassy was uh, met the Prime Minister as soon as possible and had, uh, had um, strong dealings, you have the tension between the regional power, India, and uh, it's concern about its presence. And it's, it's in a way, there have been lots of articles, if you look online, lots of articles that talk about the fact that how is Sri Lanka trying to balance between its dependency, economic dependency, um, and in a way the debt dependency with China on the one hand, and the neighborhood dependency, the close ties uh, with India, and along with that, how it can um, handle the uh, the the interest that the quad that quad members, USA, India, Australia, and Japan, especially India, Japan, and USA, has on Sri Lanka, especially when it comes to the, their. Um, their views or their, their stated, uh, if you look at some of the reports and speeches and, and concerns highlighted, you see that, that um, there is a concern about uh, how close can Sri Lanka be towards um, India uh, with, with this background and the, the baggage that uh, Godha Beraj Paksa had. So, um, we, we can tie in another component of it, which is that um, Gotabaya Rajapaksa where it's clearly stated that we must work closely with India to ensure regional security and also to engage with other SARC and BIMSTEC countries. So while um, Sri Lanka has had a, 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 a close relations with uh, India in terms of the regional and uh, extra regional organizations. For example, Sri Lanka has taken a leadership role in SARC. Sri Lanka has um, been a, a very core member of BIMSTEC as well as IORA. It has also been a, a very uh, active uh, external observer and then a, a, a kind of a partner when it comes to ASEAN and other organizations. And um, uh, sorry about the sounds. Um, but you can also see uh, how in all of these endeavors, 
how COVID has impacted these relations. The COVID diplomacy, uh, whether it comes from uh, the, the uh, vaccine maitri of uh, uh, India to a Chinese outreach of uh, donating or gifting the uh, vaccinations. All of this, you can see that this has really impacted Sri Lanka. And I'll get to that in a, like in a few minutes to highlight this. Um, another aspect of this is the economic part of it. Uh, Sri Lanka was doing well before uh, COVID really impacted because there was, um, in the manifesto, it was talking about enhancing trade relations with Middle East, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, South Korea, Philippines, uh, as well as working with the uh, USA, China, European Union, and Japan and Canada, South Africa, Australia, Russia, and Britain in terms of commerce. So we had a thriving uh, tourism industry. Our IT sector was you know, connected very closely and developing um, sometimes with the assistance of uh, Southeast Asian uh, nations. So we had all that, but what, um, what kind of made this a big problem? And you can see that from, uh, from who is really the secretary to the ministry, um, admiral, the former admiral of Sri Lanka uh, Navy, um, Professor um, uh, Kolambage was in charge as soon as COVID uh, emerged, um, like, uh, probably February onwards of uh, 2020, you see um, that um, uh, Admiral Kolomage was in charge of the repatriation of Sri Lankans um, living in abroad who were impacted by the COVID or, or the situation of COVID in those countries. Not that they themselves had COVID, but that the employment was impacted. So a lot of the Middle Eastern countries, but also all over the world, wherever Sri Lankan migrants existed, he was placed in charge of bringing them to Sri Lanka, or organizing the planes, all that. And you can see that Gautabha Rajapaksa placing him as a secretary to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or Foreign Relations. This means uh, that the COVID aspect of foreign relations uh, has taken a higher or stronger uh, um, that uh, in terms of priority, it has impacted the country more. So what, what does that mean? So for example, along with the, the kind of um, vaccine diplomacy is the vaccine pressure on how to get the Sri Lankans back to Sri Lanka? What's going to happen to our tourism industry? What, how is Sri Lanka going to uh, reestablish itself in, in, the, in the international scenario? So all these things are, uh, would have played a, a, a kind of played a role in prioritizing um, COVID as the biggest hurdle faced by Sri Lanka. And that might be one of the major reasons why Professor or Ad Admiral uh, Kolombage was uh, placed as the secretary. He is not a career diplomat, but at the same time, he does have a doctorate in international relations. And he is someone who has had um, connections with uh, international uh, entities, uh, especially Australia and other countries when it comes to um, during uh, 2009 to 2012, 13 or 14, about um, Sri Lankan uh, illegal migration. So he's someone who has had ties, but some, the person who was in charge of repatriation, being placed in charge of the entire foreign policy, um, kind of the structure, I know the minister and the others are at the helm, but the key decision making about uh, the plans about the COVID, uh, uh, you know, vaccinations, about what is the policy, all this shows that COVID is at the right now the biggest concern in Sri Lanka. And, and um, the other aspect of it, and this is very interesting, is how 
everything has been impacted. All the entire manifesto, every aspect of the manifesto, uh, spoken by um, Kotabe Rajapaksa, has been impacted. The Sri Lanka's reliance on countries has increased. The Sri Lanka's debt has uh, progressively impacted us. The, the fact that the foreign reserves are less, the fact that our uh, devaluing of Sri Lanka's currency, all this is intrinsically, inherently linked to the COVID outbreak. And uh, so one of the things that we can note is the fact that COVID itself has um, derailed some of the some of Sri Lanka's positive um, steps during this the year of uh, the government being in power. Um, so um, so uh, I mean um, the trade agreements with the um, the free trade agreements with India and Pakistan or all this has been impacted um, along with the fact that what is happening internationally, what is happening in the neighborhood countries, especially when it comes to Afghanistan and all that, is also um, a problematic situation for Sri Lanka. Um, so Sri Lanka, if, if you look at the fact that Sri Lanka was getting a majority of its, um, of its income, foreign uh, earnings from the migrants, working in the Middle East and, and the tea and other exports and those being impacted and along with the fact that the tourism industry and others have been drastically impacted has been uh, a major concern. So as I said, um, uh, we have um, the kind of, we have since the emergence of that, uh, the, uh, the COVID situation, we have had saving lives and preparing for tomorrow has been Sri Lanka's uh, response. And they have had to get further funding. Uh, for example, um, the World Bank and other uh, funding was essential, even though IMF and, uh, has you know, uh, certain funds that were in place at the start of uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa's presidency has been uh, curtailed and reduced, but whatever money there is, uh, the pandemic emergency uh, finance facility has uh, taken a toll. Um, um, uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, there are some questions that are emerging. So, um, as I said all along, I will reduce the, uh, my presentation for half an hour as requested. And uh, I will await your um, questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Manisha, for that very comprehensive overview of uh, Sri Lanka's foreign policy. I think you, um, from everything you explained, there are a couple of points that uh, strike me. One is that how the foreign policy decision making are impacted by, by the baggage uh, bringing from the past events by the political elites, etc. And I think it really makes sense uh, when we see the situation at the moment, whether it's to do with our relationship with the um, uh, West and the United States, or whether it's about our relationship with India, China, or whatever the decision making that uh, the government is trying to take with regard to our foreign economic policy. I think our past baggages are impacting a lot. Uh, the second factor is the impact domestic factors have on uh, foreign policy decision making. I think that is also a very interesting um, point because uh, when we observe Sri Lankan foreign policy, uh, I think we see the level of influence from the domestic factors, whether uh, most recently, like when it comes to the um, East Container Terminal issue or um, previously with the Hambantha to port issue, we see a lot that the there is this domestic factors and how people feel about uh, these decisions and how they express their um, uh, feelings about these decisions have some impact on Sri Lanka's foreign policy decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, then I think another important factor you mentioned is how the impact of COVID in every 
as it has impacted everything in the country, including economic, social life, politics, day-to-day -day activities, it has also impacted the foreign policy. So uh, these are very, uh, all interesting, very interesting points. So before we are receiving some questions in the chat box also. So before we move to the questions, let me um, ask some of the questions that I have. Um, so you mentioned at the beginning about the non-aligned foreign policy of Sri Lanka, and uh, I mean it's true that we have been for, we have been talking about the non-aligned foreign policy since uh, forever, and we call ourselves having a non-aligned po foreign policy. So if President Gotabaya Rajapaksha also briefly mentioned non-aligned foreign policy, then later he changed the term into neutral foreign policy. And uh, then there's also this uh, like express, expressing interest in Asia-centric foreign policy. Now, in a context where we see countries who champion non-aligned policy, like India also sort of like slowly moving away from such a context, how feasible is it for Sri Lanka to um, follow non-aligned or neutral foreign policy? And secondly, how beneficial this would be? Yeah, I mean, we have, um, this has been actually a, a, a major kind of, a, uh, if you look at some of the foreign policy writings on Sri Lanka in the last, um, I could, I should say about last 12 years or so, uh, this has been a major topic. Is Sri Lanka neutral? Or non-aligned. Non-aligned is not just about the alignment between, uh, which, you know, when it was created, it was between the Cold War superpowers, but the underlying Panchasil um, views, that's what it's, uh, what it means to be non-aligned, um, you know, respect to sovereignty, all those things. But um, it is, so the, the current discussions on Sri Lankan foreign policy when it comes to is Sri Lanka neutral? Or even better one is, can Sri Lanka be neutral? Is, um, is something that is, because we're hedging, we're bandwagoning, we're doing a lot of things where um, our, uh, uh, some people can say that our independence uh, as a decision maker has been impacted. In some sense, we have been mindful of uh, our neighbors, especially India, since, uh, since 1940s, of course, we have been mindful of the decisions taken by the our neighbor. We have been sometimes bandwagoning, meaning we have taken and joined there. There are certain decisions that India has done. Uh, but at the same time, you can see that, I mean, we have been trying to do a balancing act uh, for a long time. Initially, it was balancing act between, of course, as you can see from the Cold War superpowers. Then it's a balancing act between, say, India and Pakistan, and uh, then it's a balancing act between India and China. And now we are doing another unique uh, balancing act, which is uh, India, yes, China, yes, all those are there, but also balancing those influences with Sri Lanka's presence in regional organizations. They have taken a leading role in, uh, and I mentioned that as well, they have taken a leading role in not just, um, you know, SARC, uh, which, uh, you know, it's not very active. And uh, there are, it's, it's uh, the political issues between India, Pakistan, and all this has resulted in this, uh, certain aspects of SARC not being active. But BIMSTEC, IORA, we have been real, I mean, we are founders. If you look at the list of countries that have, are the founders of these organizations, we are founders of this uh, BIMSTEC IORA. We have been very active in trying to place ourselves with, not within the region, but extra regionally as well, whether it's in terms of the nearby neighbors or in terms of a larger, the IORA, 50 odd countries of IORA 
and how do you get all of those things in? So we have been trying to balance ourselves from that. As so very few people have looked at that part of the balancing, but I think that is something that is uh, quite interesting that we are, uh, how do you remain neutral? I, I don't think that word is, because when you use the word neutral, there's a, there's a huge um, baggage in that <laughs> word as well. Um, but um, when it comes to being friends of all, how's that? Uh, there are times when we are leaning towards one, leaning towards the other. Um, but at the same time, our balancing act has become more complex. A balancing act, I would say, has, I would just say, if you want to look at balancing in Sri Lanka, you have to, uh, what one of my professors used to say, is you have to de pancake it, meaning you can't look at it in a flat surface and say, oh, here's India, here's China, Sri Lanka is going to balance it. It's not. You have to de pancake it and look at the layers in between and see whether, how does Sri Lanka balance Indian influence by through its presence in BIMSTEC. Because then you have the economic aspects of that. Then you have the sectoral aspects of that. Uh, then how do you balance and all that? You have to deep pancake the, 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 the kind of the flat idea of balancing. We are bandwagon in some sense. I have admit that. But, but I think there are more than one layer there. I hope I answered that question. Very interesting analogy about the um, um, flat pancake layers. <laughs> <laughs> so I have my own questions, but uh, there is a question from the audience related to what you just talked about. How Sri Lanka, uh, you mentioned that Sri Lanka is using regional organizations uh, to um, balance between India, China, and whatever the other powers. What role do you see for Sri Lanka in regionalism and multilateralism? And how Sri Lanka can use these uh, uh, the frameworks for its economic policy, foreign economic policy and foreign, foreign policy in general? Mm -hmm. uh, Sri Lanka has always wanted to be part of a larger entity. If you look at Sri Lanka's first foray into uh, outside of South Asia was in 1954, uh, when uh, Sir John Kotelawala introduced, you know, invited Asian and African leaders, and he introduced a similar concept of uh, non-alignment. The, the idea of that was introduced then. So. Sri Lanka has always strived to be part uh, of a larger entity, but has always found uh, that its designation as a South Asian country sometimes hinders. The SAR comes only in 1980. That's almost 40 years after independence. Um, but it, um, and, and SAR is, um, in terms of the economic aspects of SAC, yes, you do have bilateral relations, you have the, you know, um, SAPTA and all, all these little um, agreements which are, which are in place. But at the same time, if you look at the economic economy of all the SAC countries, the majority of trade goes on outside of SAC. So Sri Lanka being able to go beyond SAC, uh, beyond uh, this region and go to a larger uh, understanding of region is, is that's where Sri Lanka's entire um, uh, focus should be. And I think if you look at how uh, Sri Lanka is playing uh, the uh, different roles at different levels uh, in terms of um, BIMSTEC, for example, um, you can see that that Sri Lanka is um, is seen that other than going bilateral, these multilateral linkages really really help Sri Lanka. So we are doing a bandwagoning and a balancing act, 
So we are doing that also is trying to balance it out with uh, within Sri Lanka. Uh, so um, kind of if you if I mean um, uh, in in terms of um, uh, how it's, uh, um, we are we are doing this um, uh, accommodative foreign policy trajectory. Um, where we have um, uh, we have tried as as in a, in a IR terminologies to look at uh, we are trying to minimize the negative impacts of from being members of regional organizations. That means um, so uh, how how is Sri Lanka doing it um, in terms of uh, uh, summits conferences being uh, for example. Um, uh, foreign secretary, uh, you know, represented Sri Lanka the 19th Council of the Ministers in Iowa in 2019, and then um, you know, Pro Foreign Secretary Kolumbia, for example, talked about how is Sri Lanka going to play a major role in the Indian Ocean, def uh, defining our future Track 1.1, and the highlighting of that Iora A, um, Iora, and then the kind of um, the 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 fact that when it comes to binstick, um, even every prime minister from uh, uh, President Maithripala Sirisena uh, also has highlighted the importance of having uh, the 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 presence of Sri Lanka in these uh, extra regional uh, kind of extra regional in the sense South Asian extra regional entities. Uh, so I would say that um, as a as a small power, Sri Lanka is vulnerable to threats from the nearest to the external, from a internal external environments, from uh, great powers to other regional powers and extra regional powers. Yes, I'm not talking about threats as in military, but I'm talking threats in terms of impacting its economy, impacting its decision making. So getting memberships in organizations that overlap, memberships that overlap. So for example, Sri Lanka and India and Bangladesh are part of a but and uh, India and Sri Lanka and a lot of other countries are members of IORA. And uh, there's overlapping between Sri Lanka, India and Bangladesh when it comes to SARC. So there is an overlapping of, um, of memberships. So when you have overlapping of memberships, there's a strengthening of uh, the connections and, the, and, and a way of uh, keeping the bandwagoning entity like India informed, but at the same time going out of the way um, uh, to, to assist. So there's a, I would say Sri Lanka has tried to balance um, the situation when it comes to being members of um overlapping regional organizations um especially in in order to get economic in, uh, against as well as um welfare opportunities that are uh, if you look at uh SAG, Instec, and iora from these organizations that is that um um so it it transplants in a way its core values to a to a in through those organizations in order to balance out the situation of um, having a powerful India having a powerful and impactful China and all the other countries that are interested in Sri Lanka's geopolitical location. I hope that answered. Yes, <laughs> yes, so since you mentioned about in the IORA, let me a little bit probe uh, into that as uh, um, some more. Like, since the end of the war, we know that uh, successive governments have been talking about Sri Lanka either making the hub in the Indian Ocean and then they actually um, rephrased it as reclaiming the Indian Ocean identity. How do you see the present government uh, following through this agenda? 
And how do you see that Sri Lanka is using its uh, foreign relationship for this purpose? And uh, what future Sri Lanka you see for Sri Lanka in maritime govern governance? Oh, um, um, in 2017-18, Sri Lanka uh, strived to, under uh, Prime Minister Vikramasinghe's period, strive to uh, bring um, attention to Sri Lanka as a hub within the Indian Ocean geographical placement, but also in terms of uh, its, its, um, its, its potential whether it's the ports, whether it's the presence, whether, um, you know, uh, so there was a major conference as well. And um, I think um, one of the things that came, that was very interesting was how um, Sri Lanka and other Indian Ocean countries cannot, now these are Indian Ocean countries, right? There are 54 other Indian Ocean countries that, that um, straddle the Indian Ocean, that they cannot um, make major decisions without the extra regional powers. And of course, USA was there, obviously, but the other part was about China. Can And there was lots of uh, pre-summit discussions about that as well, that you cannot, uh, leave China, that can you also leave out? So yes, we have a, this Indian ocean but you cannot leave out all the countries that traverse, um, the, the, whose ships traverse the Indian Ocean. This is a huge maritime route. And, uh, and uh, when you, so can you exclude extra regional powers, extra, extra external to the Indian Ocean. So that has been a, a, a kind of a, a discussion uh, that was kind of, it was obvious when you look at uh, the, the, the 2018 conference and, and all the kind of the place and how we, how our uh, presidents, uh, prime minister, or in this case, foreign ministers have spoken up and spoken about the importance of Iora in, um, in Sri Lanka, for Sri Lanka, sorry. So for example, even at the first ministerial meeting of Iora in uh, 1997, uh, <clears throat> Iora needs to facilitate, uh, so Lakshman Khadiragama uh, said that Iora needs to facilitate um, Inter, uh, interregional trade um, by reducing barriers, non-trade barriers and all that. But um, he was also highlighting the importance of open regionalism. That we cannot isolate ourselves uh, by just saying, okay, here is the region. Asak, here's the region, South Asia. But to have an open regionalism means you take the global into the region. So the global economic, um, the positive impacts of being part of the global economy must be um, you know, taken up and um, uh, how should I say the enriched, that to enrich, the regional entities. So while we are talking about, yes, you need to reclaim it, there is a there is a kind of a, it's naive to assume that we can reclaim when this is such a important highway. Um, and the international waters and, and there's so many things that are coming into place here that, um, that uh, just a simple speech cannot do. Uh, yeah, I think that is uh, that. Um, yeah, uh, so that's why. <laughs> got another question related to Sri Lanka's Indian Ocean identity and uh, where Sri Lanka plays itself in the, in, the, in the Indian Ocean factor. So we recently, Sri Lanka experienced the 
worst environmental disaster of history with the express pearl uh, leak. Um, so in your opinion, how important are environmental issues in Sri Lanka's foreign policy? And has this leak um, has made the government to take any step in regional maritime governance? I think one of the problems we have as a country is that our laws haven't uh, advanced uh, uh, to, uh, to keep step with the, the environmental issues that are happening outside of our maritime region, our, our uh, economic zone. Uh, so is it? Um, so um, that has become a very problematic concern for Sri Lanka. Uh, the, the issue regarding how can Sri Lanka protect its minerals? Can a country, uh, a, a trawler or a, or a mining um, company to, uh, move in and you know, start drilling one kilometer outside of Easy? Uh, what can Sri Lanka do to protect its its environment? These are um, these are issues that actually was highlighted by our worst environmental disaster. What can what could we have done, and how can we punish? Now, uh, this is I mean, imagine if someone was outside of the region, outside of our control, outside of our maritime control, but the disaster itself is coming to our country. For example, if you look at the 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 way the waves have uh, the way the waves come into Sri Lanka, I mean the larger um, ocean waves, you will see that um, a lot of pollution pollutants like uh, plastics and other things end up in Sri Lankan shores, not because uh, Sri Lanka itself is a is a um, is a polluter in itself, but rather outside of the country, the pollution, the 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 what what all kind of uh, tanks, what uh, ships, what and the other countries have, and and within those countries, the the industries have put into the ocean is coming to our shores, and we have no recourse. Locally, we can, but this is about transnational, international, bilateral um, issues which are impacting Sri Lanka, and um, we have to uh, we have to develop other than the Paris Agreement and all those international level agreements. There has to be a regional agreement uh, on how to overcome this. Um, uh, so yeah, um, sorry, yeah, that's that's my answer because I, that is not a, um, while I do speak of those things, I think that's not my expertise at the moment, no but this is such much I do. But I think you gave uh, us a broad idea of uh, Sri Lanka's situation. Now, when we discuss Sri Lanka's foreign policy, I think the major interest is always about how Sri Lanka is balancing between China and India and what's our relationship with these two countries. So we get a lot of, uh, quite a number of questions on that. Mm -hmm. So um, one question is about the uh, general public perception about India and China. Like uh, you mentioned about the vaccine diplomacy of China and India and um, outside the question of strategically balancing various regional and global power tensions, are there perhaps any um, countries that the Sri Lankan public would prefer more uh, to um, have better relations or like whether what in, uh, in other words, like to what countries Sri Lanka's public key, key perception is more inclined to uh, between India and China and also aside from India and China? I think um, Sri Lanka, especially with the lease and uh, and even the East Terminal and all that, Sri Lanka is very weary of uh, the two countries. 
it's very um, hesitant. It's obvious from the, if you look at the newspaper articles, if you look at the speeches that are that occurred at the at the height of both these situations, if you look at if you looked at the protest from the ports, the the workers, and I mean there was so much opposition that there is a major concern about uh, how should Sri Lanka tackle these two countries. There isn't uh, there doesn't seem to be an answer from the general public. It's just a statement saying, you know, we are weary of this. Uh, but at the same time, you note that um, when it comes to nearby or almost nearby neighbors, Sri Lanka is a very, um, seems to be uh, having a very positive uh, view of having uh, relations with Japan. Even though it is a quad country, it is, you know, it was part of the, the, the East Terminal uh, discussions. But Sri Lanka's, uh, the, the history of Sri Lanka's relationship with Japan from the San Francisco uh, statements by J.R. Jayavardhana, I mean, despite the bombings and everything during World War II, um, has been quite positive. The image of um, uh, Japan and also the fact that um, in terms of um, uh, the, 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 the situation when it comes to the uh, COVID diplomacy or COVID vaccine diplomacy, Sri Lanka ha seems to be very enam enamored with developing further ties with countries like Singapore. Uh, especially with the Singaporean government's donation of medical supplies, test kits. So you can see, uh, if you look at the Singhala English Tamil newspapers and how they have highlighted a loan, loans being given to purchase versus gifts and um, the, the kind of um, that, that the, I think the projection that uh, Singapore wants to do with terms of a, uh, a dependable partner and a resource-rich partner, which is there to assist, uh, has taken uh, people's ideas and they, they actually are, uh, I mean, they don't see uh, Singapore as a threat to Sri Lanka. They don't see it as something that both India or China will see it as a threat. I mean, closer you get to China, Japan, there is a concern about how do you balance India, China, and then uh, Japan. But Singapore seems to be, um, uh, you know, uh, country, I mean, it, it's not that um, Singapore is something, uh, Singapore's involvement in Sri Lanka was something new. There was a lot of pre-COVID period, there was so many, companies in Sri Lanka and um, in the growth sector, in, in, in the food, beverage, tourism, infrastructure, all the sectors, uh, Singapore was always there as a presence. But, um, um, you know, um, there is, you know, Jayanath Kolambage, um, the secretary, foreign secretary, um, at, the, at one point said that, um, that Sri Lanka should move away from Western-centric diplomacy and move more towards the Asian-centric diplomacy. And um, you can see, if you look at the vaccine diplomacy, that there is a more Asian-centricness to um, the, the diplomacy that's going on. It, it, if you look, I mean, it is China and India that's the major uh, providers, but um, you do get a lot of others, uh, Asian countries being presented as as being friends of Sri Lanka, as being uh, partners of Sri Lanka. Um, so that is quite an interesting uh, narrative, a discourse that's uh, emerging and that's been highlighted uh, at the domestic level. So that's quite an interesting uh, component. Um, and um, uh, I think, um, I think um, the, uh, if you look at the foreign minister's uh, speech, 
um, in um, first week of uh, last month at the first international forum on uh, vaccine cooperation. Um, uh, he, he was highlighting the fact that we have done these things, but at the, at the same time, he was talking about which countries were the providers and which were the, the, the how do we need cooperation and how are we going to do this, especially in terms of the role of research, it's not just about vaccine, sub, um, but the importance of uh, country cooperation not just about Western companies, but also country cooperation um, the, on, uh, on, on vaccine cooperation. So vaccine diplomacy, vaccine, all that, and the vaccine cooperation. Um, so that is quite, a, quite an important factor that has, um, I think, um, uh, you know, and there is a joint statement on vaccine cooperation uh, but uh, you know the importance of within the uh, region is very important. And if you look at um, even the ASEAN Regional Forum um, uh, and Sri Lanka's, um, like we are co-sponsoring the joint statement of promoting youth peace and uh, security agenda. Uh, so we are not just as members, but we are also trying to reach out and do continue this. Asia-centric um, focus in our foreign policy making. Right. I think that uh, it's true. He, I think you are right. Like Sri Lanka tends to be friendly, and people are favorable to any country as long as they don't feel too much uh, pressure or too much involvement. The moment you see another power getting too involved, that's when the public sentiment changes. So that's what I think we are seeing with when it comes to China, India, the United States, or any other country. As long as they do not get involved too much on the domestic affairs, uh, people are very Sri Lankans are very welcoming. Uh, so uh, I have. Uh, got a couple of questions on uh, China's relationship also, Dr. Manisha. Let me combine them and pose you, pose you like a single question because, um, because we are running out of time also. So one aspect of, I think the one um, major characteristic of China, Sri Lanka's relationship with China is the Def military cooperation or the defense cooperation that specially began during the um, uh, latter stage of the war. So I know that your uh, research area focuses on conflict in Sri Lanka and uh, um, human rights, etc. So in your, in your opinion, how do you see military relationship between China and Sri Lanka evolving? since then and uh, what is the future and what are the developments you see in the current scenario? That is one question. The second one is about uh, China being a, a financial provider for Sri Lanka. Uh, on um, this Monday, we had a lecture on domestic politics and the speaker highlighted that in a context where Sri Lanka will not have um, many uh, offers from other countries in terms of economic support, perhaps China would be the only country. Then are we sort of like decoupling with an unaligned foreign policy and are we sort of getting cornered uh, into the Chinese side? So um, these two questions on Chinese relations. Uh, let's, uh, I mean, start uh, with the military uh, angle and i'll be quite quick i mean if you look at of course sri lanka's um, ties with in terms of military ties with not just uh, uh, china but pakistan and other countries was heightened uh, near in at the very start of the 21st century yes but you can also see that military assistance grants were given um and then um i think there was a period of time um 
in 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 um, if around 2017, 18, 19 period when uh, it was not Gota Bir Rajapaksa or Mahindra Rajapaksa government, but um, the the military protocols were signed and military aid was given to Sri Lanka from China. And uh, even now, um, I think um, last month. Uh, there was there was a uh, there was an announcement on um, the military co cooperation between these two countries. So there is a concern, especially when it comes when, when you link that with the fact that Sri Lanka is seems to be dependent on uh, Chinese money, monetary uh, monetary assistance. That Sri Lanka is tilting, and this uh, this accusation was given uh, at the time of the first Mahindra Rajapaksa period as well, that Sri Lanka's, um, I mean, we kind of shifted, but we never tilted. So is Sri Lanka tilting towards uh, a situation where, um, what, 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 what we would call is a tipping point where, you know, um, the, uh, the image I'll tell you is the, the straw that broke the camel's back, right? Where is, uh, you can tilt a little, but where is the point where, of no return. Um, you have to understand, and in my very at the very start, I told this also that when Sri Lanka won the war militarily, all the um, all the assurances of uh, development grants and loans and assistance that were given during the ceasefire period by Japan and all these other countries just dried up, and Sri Lanka was left with no country willing to assist the Sri Lanka to develop uh, the port and other things where immediate profit is not viable. So if you're looking for immediate profit and that's what organizations, companies, countries were looking at, even though Sri Lanka is strategically significant, so you, know, you have to remember, Hambadra port was offered to India. The development of the port was offered to India, uh, but how do you uh, kind of sell or market when the profits might take a long time? And so China took on that mantle, and of course we ended up being kind of part of the BRI uh, uh, project. And of course there is a huge debt problem. Uh, but I would also say that while we do need China. We do need China's economic assistance. China also needs us. It is not a not a like a a total power imbalance. If you look at the the relations with China and Sri Lanka, China is not going to. I mean, China is right now developing ties with Pakistan and trying to develop ties with Afghanistan and all because of the BRI, um, which goes past. Um, past, uh, uh, you know, the mountains in Pakistan area, but it also wants to develop um, uh, roads and uh, build links with Afghanistan. So it, it has a lot of um, involvement in a lot of areas and it does need us. It does need Sri Lanka. So we have to strategically maneuver that and balance that their needs with our needs because our, our geopolitical presence is unique. And just because the funding is available doesn't make us yes men or women at uh, different forums. We have shown over the years that we do think independently when it comes to certain things. Uh, of course, our, uh, I mean, like Mrs. Bandar Nayak period and all that, we were very, very, outspokenly independent, but even now you can see that we are not yes men when it comes to certain things where um, at the United Nations, at, at different fora, uh, we are not yes men. We are, we are trying to do that, but there is a, there is a fear that the balance will tip. And, and that's where the concern is. Right now, I think, um, because other countries are also assisting Sri Lanka, there are ADB loans and other loans available for the COVID situation. 
uh, if if for tourism, if the industries, everything can recover quickly, it's possible. It's also possible if the shipping sector can, is uh, is um, uh, is able to. Uh, I mean, within Sri Lanka, the ports are able to entice um, the 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 huge companies by saying that you know if you go to countries like Singapore it's three extra days so you have a saving of of uh, the kind of the petrol the, the, the fuel as well as the time by coming to uh Thamban report and it has the ability to uh for for kind of the deep water um is available so the, the potential is that if we can recover that the debt that Sri Lanka will incur because of the COVID, that's something completely outside of what was planned, right? Of COVID, if we can stem that, or if we can reduce that, then we have a better chance. That's a lot of ifs. Yes, I think it is a lot of ifs for the uh, entire world when it comes to COVID. Uh, it has been a very interesting uh, discussion so far, Dr. Manisha, and we have a lot of questions. I don't think we will have time to answer all of them. But if I don't ask this one sitting in Singapore, I think our discussion will be completely incomplete. I mean, our discussion will be incomplete. Um, this is about Sri Lanka's relationship with uh, Singapore. Now, mm -hmm. one of the promises of President Gotabe Rajapaksha in coming to power was to re-examine bilateral trade agreements made uh, with other countries during the pre previous government. And so because of this, Sri Lanka's agreement with Singapore, which was signed in 2018, was also got re-examined. Now, even though um, relationship has been moving forward gradually and has experienced an upward trajectory, of course, over the years, due to this um, stall of the moving forward with the agreement relationship, the trade trade relationship the agreement, 2018, right? Yes, 2018 yeah. uh, agreement. So, in your opinion, what is uh, Sri Lanka, Singapore's relationships future in terms of trade and economic relationship, how we can move past from this situation and uh, go ahead uh, in improving our trade and economic relationship. Um, you know, when you hear at the very start of uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa's presidency, he um, highlighted the fact that he should re-examine all bilateral trade agreements um, signed in the previous five years, meaning from about 2015 onwards. And he also said he wanted to renegotiate certain ones. But you're right, there are there were so many um, uh, issues regarding um, regarding um, all these. I think again the domestic impacts the in, kind of uh, international uh, relations. Um, so there is there was a major concern um, about how do you restart. Um, but uh, the other other um, and I think major problem lies in um, for for Sri Lankan government is I mean how does how does Sri Lanka overcome the COVID issue? And at the same time, develop these uh, the opportunities that are um, that are emerging. It, 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 it is important to renegotiate, and it hasn't uh, it hasn't uh, Sri Lanka has not been able to uh, reevaluate and renegotiate these because of the COVID situation. And um, so, for example, um, there were discussions in in the early part of 20, uh, 2020 about um, you know agribusinesses, about how are we going to do about food security side of it. So there were lots of different uh, focus on, on how do we create this, uh, these bilateral relations without jeopardizing um, the internal support 
from the uh, for the government because the you know Rajapaksa government has had um, um, uh, kind of um, how do I say this has had major challenges even though it's it's um, it, it it did emerge out through a landslide but there were economic the, the the constitutional challenges the 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 kind of the um, there are lots of challenges that are in place right so the the, the Singaporean um, free trade agreement um, becoming a, a controversial one uh, was um, we discussed, and I will say that there were, if I remember correctly, um, in reevaluating, but I mean, reevaluating this this agreement, uh, the free trade agreement. Um, there was a um, there was a discussion that there would be about twenty or so amendments that needed to be done. I think around twenty, um, but. Um, um, you know, um, that negotiations with Singapore had to be done in order to make these amendments. I think um, uh, there was so much opposition for this free trade agreement that, that that's why I said the domestic really does impact the, the bilateral or any relations Sri Lanka has. Uh, but um, uh, the 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 um, whether um, um, whether uh, Singapore is amiable to these amendments, um, I do not know because um, as far as I am aware, this is still under negotiation, and I think this this uh, this came up um, fairly recently. I think about. Six months, seven months ago, that the the revaluation came up with these um, twenty or so amendments. Um, so, but at the same time, I mean, um, you have to remember that Sri Lanka, prior to COVID and prior to everything, was a major investor in uh, Sri Lanka. Um, I think um, China and India next to China and India, um, Singapore would have been third or fourth. Uh, in, and, and whether these 20 odd points that need to be amended are amiable, and if so, uh, once Singapore agrees to it, whether Sri Lankans, the domestic uh, entities who oppose this in 2017-18 period, are amiable to that also uh, is up for discussion. And we'll see, it, I think it depends on how um, this is communicated to the public. I think there are about uh, 20 or so amendments that in the revaluation by uh, the government, this government, um, that they have said that there are around 20 or so changes that the amendments that need to be done in this free trade agreement in, in order to it not be so controversial. Right. It was a controversial one, yes, right. for Sri Lankans. Yes, I think um, it's important that uh, Sri Lanka move ahead and negotiate in a friendly way and uh, do whatever it is possible to enhance the relationship because we have been having a strong uh, economic partnership with Singapore for years, and this will be the next uh, step forward. Um, Dr. Manisha, it, it has been a great pleasure to have you here, and it has been a very interesting discussion. My final question to you is, what do you see Sri Lanka's foreign policy would be for the next four years in this administration? How do you see Sri Lanka's government will move ahead with its foreign relationship? I think there are uh, trajectories you can assume. One of the trajectories is uh, economic. I mean, we are we are in a position where uh, we are uh, we're desperate for 
foreign investments, for tourism to flourish again, for a lot of things to happen. And we are kind of in a stuck. Of course, the whole globe is facing this issue. But in terms of the trajectory of foreign policy, I think economy has to be number one. Uh, because whether we balance India or China, and everything is related to how, we, how economically independent we are. I think um, the second um, trajectory would be about um, uh, how Sri Lanka utilizes, as a small country, utilizes its presence, its geopolitical presence, but it's also its presence within these regional organizations. I think uh, Sri Lanka can become a very forceful entity, as it was in the non-aligned movement a uh, very powerful entity at regional level, uh, overlapping regional entities as well, uh, and can use that as a, a balancing rather than a bandwagoning uh, uh, as approach uh, for uh, decision-making. I think another trajectory that uh, needs to be understood and uh, explored is about the human rights concerns at the United Nations, but also the role of the Sri Lankan diaspora and, and, uh, and how, how this, um, this narrative is being presented. And, uh, you know, Ravinath Ari Singh, when he was in February, when they were taking, you know, when they were talking about um, the fact that um, Sri Lanka was um, withdrawing from the commitment, um, gave a very um, very logical explanation. But what what the narrative has come about, if you look at Human Rights Watch and other entities, is why isn't Sri Lanka focusing on this? And um, so this, this needs to be a Sri Lankan trajectory. I'm not sure how much emphasis Sri Lanka will place on this, but I think it has to be a, a core aspect. The other is the other balancing act Sri Lanka has to do, which is between the local domestic environmental needs, environment that um, that looks at, shall we say, um, the kind of the, um, the the internal internal aspects of uh, economic capabilities, the interest groups, the competing elites, the opposition, the the. The, the influencing groups that are not part of the opposition, but are part of the social culture fabric of the country. And, um, and also, um, I think um, how these, uh, you have to realize that one of the most impactful things that are happening is what is happening in neighboring countries like Afghanistan. So that's another trajectory, which is, I would put place it as the unexpected. That, that are, it's, it's dynamic, international relations is dynamic and certain foreign policy decisions are very um, set in stone, but certain reactive uh, foreign policy decisions are based on triggers and certain changes. So how, what is going to happen uh, with the Taliban and what is going to happen um, with with whether Afghanistan will be a center for uh, or the extremist group or, or would it be a place for to launch or whether is it going to be a uh, kind of a, a democratic type of shadow law government that is rejecting all of that. Uh, we have to see an our Sri Lankan um, reactions will be very compelling because we have 2019 Easter attack. We have all these tensions underneath with the ISIS and all that is it's still there. And um, so what is happening in the neighboring countries is going to impact. So I would also put a fifth trajectory and say for the unexpected, how Sri Lanka is able to answer and react to the unexpected um, is very, very significant and having key people and you can't, I mean, you can't react to the unexpected, but you can have people with knowledge of that region to quickly give you the answers, uh, whether it's the ocean, whether it's the 
a region, if you get the quick answers, then you can react better. Uh, so that is another trajectory which I would say unexpected. Thank you, Dr. Manisha, once again. And it has been a pleasure having you. And we had a very interesting discussion. I hope you also enjoyed this discussion as much as Thank we did. Uh, now, let me uh, call Shavenya uh, for the closing remarks. Thank you, everyone, for your presence in today's lecture. We hope to see you at future ISAS events. Thank you, and have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you all for inviting me. Thank you. <laughs>